Your Excellencies, dear ladies and gentlemen, good morning and good afternoon to everybody. On behalf of the Konrad Adenauer Foundation, I would like to welcome you to our panel discussion on COVID-19 and public governance, effective global vaccination strategies for vaccine access. My name is Martina Kaiser. I am policy advisor for global health in the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and the moderator of our panel discussion today. In cooperation with our esteemed partners, the Embassy of the Republic Korea in Berlin and the International Vaccine Institute, we have organized this event on effective vaccination strategies in order to offer a platform for dialogue and knowledge sharing between health and public policy experts from Germany and Korea. Together, we would like to discuss critical success factors of national vaccination strategies in Germany and Korea, and we would like to discuss challenges and progress in international cooperation regarding vaccination procurement and supply. Our event is timely since it is taking place during the World Immunization Week, which is an initiative of the World Health Organization that aims at promoting the use of vaccines in order to protect people of all ages and worldwide against diseases and death. And it is timely because the questions about effective vaccination strategies and about global equitable access to vaccines against COVID-19 continue to shape political debates around the globe. Vaccines are the most powerful instrument in the fight against COVID-19 and other diseases. To end this pandemic, a large share of the global population needs to be immune against the SARS-CoV-2 virus. At an unprecedented speed, effective vaccines against COVID-19 have been developed all over the world during the last month. Now the challenge is to make these vaccines available to people around the world. It is crucial that people in all countries, not only in rich countries, have access to COVID-19 vaccines. Together with our distinguished speakers and panelists, we want to discuss what role governments play in order to and can contribute to achieving this objective and how public governance manages vaccination, procurement and supply in Germany and Korea. Let me first give you some technical information before we start with the discussion. There is no translation available. You are very welcome to participate in the debate by writing your questions and comments in the chat and we will try to consider them during the panel discussion later. Please make sure to have your microphones muted during the discussion in order to avoid background noises. Thank you very much. And now I would like to give the floor to Her Excellency Ambassador Dr. Chu, the Ambassador of the Republic of Korea in Berlin for her congratulatory remarks. Please, Your Excellency, the floor is yours. Thank you. Warm greetings to all of you. As an Ambassador of the Republic of Korea to Germany, I am delighted to welcome many important guests present today to this webinar on the theme of global strategy on vaccines. I'd like to convey my deep great gratitude to the Konrad Adenauer Foundation and the International Vaccine Institute, as well as many prominent experts who have kindly accepted our invitations. Distinguished guests, it has been a year and a month since WHO declared the pandemic. It is inexpressibly sad that more than 3 million people have lost their lives since then. About two weeks ago here in Germany, President Steinmeier held a memorial ceremony for victims of the pandemic. It has a heartbreaking to reflect that due to this pandemic, unprecedented in scale and unlike anything we have ever experienced, so many people have lost their loved ones. However, this devastating epidemic has served as a chilling reminder to us of the undeniable truth that no one is safe until everyone is safe. No single country, no matter how powerful or preparous, then can address this threat alone. It is true that COVID-19 vaccinations gave rise to hope that the end of the tunnel may be in sight. However, we have come to realize that the fight is not yet over. If we don't achieve global collective immunity in the short time possible, experts warn that COVID-19 variants could somehow jeopardize the effectiveness of vaccinations. 
This is a scenario we should avoid at all costs. It is heartening that the global community took the initiative to the launch of the COVAX facility for equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines. Germany is one of the biggest contributing countries having pledged 21 billion euros. Korea, which is also actively involved with the initiative, is steadily increasing its contributions. However, the reality is that global vaccinations are not anywhere near meeting our expectations. 40 million doses of vaccines have been allocated to 100 countries through COVAX, which covers a mere 0.25% of the world population. What is more, while one in every four people got vaccinated in developed countries, it is only one out of 500 of other countries. From these statistics, statistics, it is quite clear that there is a need to increase the production of vaccines, and it is vital that we distribute them fairly. It is of key importance that every country is involved and that we draw upon and mobilize every possible resource available. Just a month ago, 25 leaders from around the globe, including those of Korea and Germany, urgently called I'm afraid that the internet connection is maybe not stable. So I would continue now with the video recorded message of Mr. George Bickerstaff, the chairperson of the IVI Board of Trustees, who had sent his welcome remarks. And then we would try afterwards to reconnect Her Excellency Ambassador Dr. Cho again. Thank you very much. Thank you for your congratulatory remarks, Ambassador Cho. I'm very pleased to welcome you all to this dialogue on the role of governments in assuring equitable access to COVID-19 vaccines and the challenges and best practices in search of effective vaccination strategies. Today's dialogue features a prestigious lineup of diplomatic and global health experts. I'd like to thank Ambassador Dr. Cho Yong Ok from the Embassy of the Republic of Korea in Berlin, Germany, for joining us, as well as Professor Ilona Kirkbush, the Director of Global Health Center for the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva, Switzerland, Dr. Chang Yi Chong, head of Korea National Institute of Infectious Diseases at the Korean Ministry of Health, Stella Danek with the German Ministry of Health, Thomas Yoshimura, director of KAS Country Program in Seoul, and everyone else tuning in from Germany, Korea, and around the world to participate in this important conversation. IVI was established in 1997 with the vision of a world free of suffering from infectious diseases. As a UN treaty-based international organization, IBI works with governments and civil society to accelerate the development of new vaccines for global health, determine the global burden of neglected diseases, and provide a vaccination training and capacity building in low and middle income countries. We've worked, benefited from a long and productive relationship with our partners in Germany, including government ministries, foundations, and research initiatives. Our ongoing efforts with German partners include working with Robert Koch Institute to track the burden of antimicrobial resistance in Southeast Asia, a project funded by the German Ministry of Health. We're also working in the International Consortium with the Institute of Tropical Medicines at Tübingen University to conduct phase one clinical trials of schistosomiasis vaccine, a project funded by the EU Horizons 2020 grant. Previously, IBI collaborated with Bernd Nocht Institute for Tropical Medicine on Salmonella Vaccine Development with the Elsie Kroner for Senecius Foundation on Typhoid Surveillance in Africa, the Cardias Association on Japanese Encephalitis Vaccine Campaign in North Korea, and the German Federal Ministry of Education and Research on the Dengue Vaccine Initiative. 
In tackling COVID-19, IBI's approach has been to leverage our lab and clinical trial expertise to support clinical and preclinical development of 10 different vaccine candidates, which has included vaccine clinical trials, supporting the establishment of WHO's international standard for anti-SARS, COVID-2 antibody, as well as epidemiological studies to expand transmission data in Sub-Saharan Africa. Through this dialogue, I hope we may explore and develop new opportunities for IVI in Germany to work together towards achieving our common global health goals, especially the equitable availability and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines on a global scale. Thank you again for being here. I look forward to the dialogue. Many thanks to Mr. Bikestaff for his warm welcome remarks and also for highlighting the importance of international cooperation with regard to research and uh, science. I'm very sorry for the interruption uh, of uh, the speech of uh, Ambassador Dr. Cho. I have seen she is now online again and I would like to hand over to you again. Your Excellency, please, the floor is yours again. Thank you very much. Please unmute yourself. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I go on my rest of speech. Yeah, just a month ago, 25 leaders from around the globe, including those of Korea and Germany, urgently called for an international pandemic treaty. In doing so, they emphasized that immunization is a global public good and we will need to be able to develop, manufacture, and deploy vaccines as quickly as possible. Korea is already taking valuable steps toward this, indeed embracing a spirit of international cooperation Korea is fully participating in the development and the production of vaccines. And Korean pharmaceutical companies were recognized for their world-class production facilities and manufacturing know-how are currently or have plans to co-produce vaccines such as AstraZeneca, Novavax, and Sputnik V. In this regard, Korea is genuinely a trusted and a solid partner in shaping a global vaccine strategy. We are keen to play our part in presenting such a strategy which will be instrumental in addressing the current vaccine shortages and in fact developing future technologies. Against this backdrop, I believe this webinar today on a global vaccine strategy is truly timely. Distinguished guests, I would like to bring my speech to close my sharing with you proverbs common to both Korea and Germany. in Korean and Shurit Pyo Shurit to come to our and still in German, encapsulate the same wisdom that even though it is considered difficult at the time, we should move, move towards it step by step. I look forward to this webinar today, serving to further the dialogue on the global vaccine strategy. And I trust that it will generate renewed impetus for cooperation between Korea, Germany, and the international community as a whole to the lofty aim we are pursuing, a noble, goals, a noble goal of tremendous importance to all humankind. Thank you. Thank you very much, Your Excellency Ambassador Dr. Cho for your congratulatory remarks and for being with us today. Let's now continue with our two keynote speeches. And I'm very happy that we could win two distinguished experts on vaccination and global health for giving the keynote speeches for today's event. Let me briefly introduce our first speaker, Dr. Jerome Kim, to you. Dr. Kim is the Director General of the International Vaccine Institute in Seoul. He is an international expert on the evaluation and development of vaccines. Prior to his function, he was the principal deputy and chief of laboratory of molecular virology and pathogenesis in the US military HIV research program. 
His research interests include HIV, molecular epidemiology, host genetics, and HIV vaccine development. Welcome, Dr. Kim. Thank you very much for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for that kind inter introduction and for the opportunity to speak today uh, at this joint symposium held with the Konrad Adenauer Stiftung on the topic of global supply of COVID-19 vaccine and equitable global distribution. These are my disclosures. So there is a vaccine at the end of the dark tunnel that COVID has created for the world. But if vaccines are the answer, what are the questions? The big questions are, can we prove that the vaccine works? And, and at this point, we have 10 vaccines that have shown safety and efficacy. So the answer, I think, is yes. Can we make the vaccine in significant quantity at high quality? We don't know. And can we use it effectively and fairly? Again, we don't know. But is this the pathway to normal, normalcy? Prove it, make it, use it, and ultimately value it. We have the first wave of vaccines, the 10 vaccines that I just mentioned. Each one has shown safety and efficacy, and particularly for efficacy against, uh, in the prevention of severe disease, hospitalization, and death, these vaccines look to be uh, quite uh, impressive. We have another wave called the wave 1B vaccines, whose efficacy results may be reported out uh, in the next few months. And another series of vaccines, the second wave vaccines, whose efficacy results could be reported out at the end of the year or the beginning of next year. At the same time, we're looking scientifically to see if we can identify a laboratory test that corresponds to protection against disease. Having this immune correlative protection may make it much easier and much faster and much cheaper to, to evaluate vaccines in the future, maybe the vaccines in the wave 1B and, and wave 2 uh, for efficacy and safety. Most of us who've been involved in, um, in vaccine development understand that there is going to be a, a short period after a vaccine is approved where production is not going to be optimal, where we will start with low rate production. This happens with airplanes, with computers, with, with a lot of other things that have to be manufactured initially at smaller quantities until all the bugs are worked out and then at much higher in much higher quantities later on. At the same time, national regulatory authorities, qualified national regulatory authorities, need to approve these vaccines. And ultimately, the World Health Organization must issue an emergency use listing which allows the vaccines to be purchased by UN agencies and used uh, in COVAX. So again, in terms of using it, we definitely need a supply, a steady, large supply of vaccines in order to vaccinate the, six, the 8 billion people in this world with approximately uh, two doses each. 16 billion doses of vaccine need to be made. And just as a point of reference, Rotavirus vaccine, which is used in uh, global health programs around the world, is recommended for use in children, um, for use in infancy in children, um, three doses. We make 100 million doses of that. And now we're talking about making 16 billion doses of a vaccine or several vaccines over the course of two years. The task is tremendous. At the same time we implement vaccination programs, we are still going to have to emphasize the use of masks distancing and crowd avoidance as, as additional measures of control in order to bring um, COVID-19 outbreaks uh, under better uh, public health control. And then finally, with successful implementation of vaccination with use, continued use of um, distancing and masks, uh, hopefully we'll get to the point where we can once again resume some of those activities that we so um, blithely uh, appreciated or underappreciated at the end of 2019. So from 300 candidates, and there have been 300 candidates or more, uh, in various stages of development, we now have 10 vaccines which have been shown to be safe and efficacious and they're listed in, in the box in red. In the box on the bottom are, are the, the actual companies and what type of vaccine they are, whether they're an RNA vaccine from Pfizer and BioNTech, 
a uh, viral vector vaccine, such as an adenovirus vaccine from AstraZeneca, Gamalea, CanSino, or Johnson & Johnson, whole inactivated vaccines from Sinopharm, Sinovac, and Barat, and then protein subunit vaccines. And there's only one at this point uh, from a small company, Biotech, in the United States called Novavax. So how are we going to get 16 billion doses of vaccine? Well, you know, when UNICEF queries the companies that are developing vac this, these vaccines, they get a very interesting answer. And you can see H2 2021, that's the second half of 2021. The companies have told UNICEF that they will have 12.6 billion doses of vaccine. 12.6 billion doses would be enough to achieve herd immunity for all the people in the world. Are we really going to get there given where we are now? A different way to look at it is to look at the purple box. The purple box are the promises made by companies that already have WHO approved vaccines. So you can see it's less than half of the total. And that might actually be much closer to the amount that we see by the end of 2021. Still, 5 billion doses of safe and efficacious COVID-19 vaccines would be a remarkable thing. What's even more remarkable is when you look in 2022, 30 billion doses the companies say they can make. Of those 30 billion doses, 11.2 billion are promised by companies that already make vaccines that are WHO approved. And again, using that as a marker, we would still be able to vaccinate uh, a significant portion of the world's population by, 20, by the end of 2022. How realistic are these? And, and how can governments and, and people around the world ensure that we get this vaccine manufactured, that it passes all the necessary quality uh, requirements, and that we if, use it effectively and equitably in global health programs? One of the partial solutions here is something that companies are already pursuing. Now, short of uh, giving up intellectual property, um, you know, turning over patents, what companies have done is they've licensed out the manufacture of hundreds of millions of doses of their vaccine. I have never seen Sanofi make a Pfizer vaccine, yet we're seeing it today. I've never seen Merck make a vaccine from Johnson & Johnson, which actually doesn't manufacture many vaccines, but it's happening now. AstraZeneca's vaccine is being manufactured in Brazil, in India, and in South Korea. Novavax's vaccine, again, Brazil, uh, sorry, India and South Korea. The manufacturers are dis distributing manufacturing around the world in order to get the vaccines that have been approved by WHO manufactured at, in significant quantity and by regional producers of known quality, which is very important for vaccines. This is a different projection. This is a projection from the Chatham House, and it's looking at demand, uh, so supply projections through the end of 2021. And you can see that even the low scenario uh, postulates that there may be 10 billion doses of vaccine available by the end of 2021. Now, will all this vaccine be WHO approved? Possibly not. But all the vaccine that's used in China and vaccine that's manufactured in India for use in India does not need WHO prequalification. So again, there are lots of different things that play into this scenario, but it looks like by the end of 2022, maybe vaccine supply may, uh, may not be an issue, maybe. Vaccine manufacturing is a complex process. Unlike a drug, which is a chemical, vaccines are biologics, and biologics have a lot more steps in their manufacture, and those steps all have to be controlled for quality. Because the last thing you want is for one dose of vaccine to be safe and efficacious, and the other dose of vaccine to have no effect at all. So companies have to be very careful that they can manufacture the same vaccine over and over and over. In fact, it's often said in vaccines, the process is the product, and the process is always quality controlled. The other part of this has to do with regulatory approval. It would be great if all the regulatory agencies, the, the Food and Drug Administrations, the, um, the regulatory authorities of, of countries around the world, were able to take a vaccine manufactured in that country to vouch for the quality of the clinical trial data and to vouch for the quality of the manufacturing. Unfortunately, not all countries around the world have this capability. So what you see in the left-hand side, the stringent regulatory authorities, are the highest level of WHO approval. WHO says that these are the, um, the countries around the world whose regulatory authorities um, really do an outstanding job at regulating the quality of clinical data and, and the quality of manufacturing. The others are functional, 
And again, not all the countries in the world are functional. All the, the stringent ones are functional, but not all the functional regulatory authorities are stringent. Korea's um, regulatory authority, the Korean um, Ministry of Food and Drug Safety is functional. The DCGI in India is functional. The NMPA in China is functional, but they are not stringent regulatory authorities, which may mean that products that are coming from India or China or Korea may have to go through a, a different type of review at the World Health Organization. A regulatory authority in Bangladesh, which is not considered functional, can approve vaccines for use in Bangladesh, but that vaccine cannot be referred to WHO for approval. So it may not be possible to just dis distribute manufacturing all over the world. It may take the presence of these functional regulatory authorities or a regulatory authority that's willing to vouch for manufacturing in a country. And, and often they're not willing to do that, particularly now, because all of them are swamped by COVID-related um, research. All right, so getting into use. Through COVAX, we have the first opportunity ever for near concurrent access to innovative vaccine technology. Typically what happens is a vaccine is approved, vaccines developed in high income countries, so rotavirus vaccine, again, approved in 2006 by the US FDA, approved by WHO in 2009, recommended for use in 2009. A hundred companies, countries, sorry, have, have accepted rotavirus vaccine into their national programs, but not, not all of them have implemented actual vaccination programs. So that globally now in 2021, 15 years after the first approval of rotavirus vaccine, 60% of the world's children do not get that vaccine. We can't let this happen with COVID-19. So for the first time, we have an organization, COVAX, 189 countries committed to distributing vaccine to high, middle, and low-income countries in the first year of introduction. That's a remarkable thing. That's something we should keep and preserve after COVID-19 has passed. It's organized by CEPI, Gabi, and the World Health Organization. 92 low- and middle-income countries will get the vaccine free of charge. Again, a remarkable thing in the first year of introduction. Do we need to get more of it? Yes. COVAX actually initially supplies only 20% of need, but it gives every country, all 189 countries, theoretically qualify for 20% of their need. Now, not all of them will, will need it, but it still means that 80% of vaccine needs are, are going to be lacking by the end of 2021. And this is the, the, the graph that many people have already been referring to. If you look at the, um, the, um, the number of doses administered per 100 people uh, and compare that to uh, gross domestic product per capita, you get a nice uh, curve. The wealthier the country, the more people are vaccinated. The poorer the country, the fewer people are vaccinated. So despite the promise of COVAX, we are still underperforming in the vaccination of people in low and middle income countries. High income countries have reserved 10 billion doses of vaccine. Modeling suggests that the exclusive use of these vaccines, of the first 2 billion doses of vaccine manufactured by the high income countries without some equity will double global COVID deaths. Now, 3 million deaths so far, 6 million deaths if we aren't able to more equitably distribute the first 2 billion doses. But it goes beyond the human cost. There's an economic cost. And that economic cost will be borne, four to five trillion dollars of economic cost by the high income countries if they cannot devise a better mechanism to share the vaccine supply uh, equitably. So how do you enter COVAX? And, and what is shown in the circle are the four vaccines that have been approved by stringent regulatory authorities, either the US, the European Union, um, MHRA in, in the UK. Of those, all four have achieved WHO uh, emergency use listing. Very important. Because to be COVAX accessible, you need to be WHO EUL approved and, um, and approved by a stringent regulatory authority or approved by a stringent regulatory authority. And so far, Novavax hasn't entered that group. But you can see that right now, we can use three vaccines, Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and J&J. Now, later on today, hopefully, the Chinese vaccines are being evaluated by WHO and maybe some of them will be approved. And that would be an enormous benefit. They are not yet in COVAX. 
So deals are, are being made now, hopefully, that will allow these vaccines, once they're, sh once they're WHO approved, to enter the COVAX mechanism. So the new questions for 2021. We have 10 vaccines. How do we know which ones to use? And is there anything in the pipeline in wave 1B or wave 2 that looks better? Will we need multivalent vaccines that cover the different mutants, the UK mutant, the South African mutant, the Brazilian mutant, now two Southern California mutants, and a whole series around what we call 617, now known as the Indian double mutant, although it actually has 13 mutations. Um, it's a real problem. What cross protection is there in vaccines? So what we, the data we have so far suggests that the vaccines may work, um, at least in a test tube. Some di actual data, uh, Johnson & Johnson and Novavax, that they actually protect against um, the South African mutant. Do we wait or do we start developing them now at risk? Will COVAX deliver on the 20% of vaccine promised in 2021? And when will the other 80% uh, be promised? Will vaccine nationalism, that is the ability of countries to withhold vaccine made within their borders from international commitments, undermine COVAX? Will vaccine geopolitics undermine COVAX so that if, a con if country A has 60 million doses of vaccine um, that it's not going to use, will it give that vaccine to COVAX, devise a new mechanism that will prioritize vaccine deliveries to countries that need it the most, or will it give it to friends and allies or, or places um, that it would like to exert greater influence? So vaccine geopolitics could undermine COVAX as well. There is an issue around vaccine security that we should have recognized earlier because vaccine manufacturing is a highly specialized process. You can't develop it overnight. And it's not something that, that you can just transfer because there are both quality issues and also regulatory issues that may stand in the way. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim, for your very insightful presentation, for the very good overview about the current state of vaccine implementation, also for raising these really important questions about how to achieve the distribution, the global supply uh, of, of vaccines worldwide. I'm looking forward to come back to this point uh, during our panel discussion later. Thank you very much that you are also available for our discussion later. Now I would like to welcome our next speaker, Professor Ilona Kickbush, who is the founder and chair of the Global Health Center at the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies in Geneva and who works also as an independent global health consultant based in Switzerland. Before she has had a distinguished career with the World Health Organization and Yale University. And in her work, she focuses on global health governance, health diplomacy and health literacy. Welcome Professor Kickbush. Thank you very much for being here with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you very much uh, for inviting me. Uh, thank you uh, for the opportunity to speak on the uh, geopolitics of uh, the uh, vaccine uh, distribution. I hope you can see my slides now. And uh, it fits very beautifully to uh, the issues that we have just heard. And uh, I hope uh, this uh, presentation will be able to show you how complex vaccine distribution is and how political it has become. If you think back to last year, uh, you will remember that uh, the focus of... Yes? Could I share this? Okay, I will try again. Can you see it now? Yes. Yes, you can yes. see it. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So if we think back just a year, and it seems a very, very, very long time ago, uh, health diplomacy and geopolitics focused very much on the World Health Organization. You will remember the fights around uh, what uh, 
we called uh, the polit virus, uh, the US-China conflict that uh, really dominated the global health discussions. And it's been very interesting to see how uh, throughout uh, this year and the process of 2020, WHO is now 100% part of the solution and no longer seen as the key problem. If we look at 2021, and uh, the speaker before me has already highlighted that, we think in global health diplomacy that vaccine equity will be the defining global health issue this year. And vaccine equity is inextricably linked to geopolitics. If you just look at uh, this map that I have put on this slide, you will see if we stick to the present distribution model and the present distribution time frame, uh, there will be many countries where vaccination won't uh, really move forward until late 2022 or from early 2023. That's a very, very long time in terms of COVID distribution. In 2020, we heard that a lot of governments gave two promises. They continuously stated that vaccines were a global public good, and they continuously stated that there should be a fair distribution of vaccines within and between countries. And that was also the basis of the ethical recommendations by the WHO and the starting point for COVAX, as we have already heard, how those 20% that are distributed through COVAX will be distributed. And the idea was 20% would be used for the most vulnerable populations and, of course, for health care staff, particularly in low and middle income countries where there is a gap, a lack of health care staff as well, and one cannot afford to lose even one staff person in such a crisis. Now, uh, you can see uh, one of the most uh, recent uh, maps of uh, COVID-19 vaccination rates, people vaccinated per 100 inhabitants. You can see uh, that uh, it's a very inequitable uh, picture, but at the same time, you can see there are different reasons why some countries are not yet highly vaccinated. You can see Australia here, for example. Australia has driven a no COVID strategy which means that at present uh, there are hardly any infected people, so they have approached the vaccination, uh, the vaccination drive uh, slower, but at the same time they are also experiencing a lack of vaccines. And here we can see a new type of development that it's not only the poor that do not have enough access to vaccines, but that we are seeing a problem even in some middle income and some high income countries. We have developed seven dimensions of vaccine diplomacy and we can see that all of them play out in relation uh, to the recent developments around vaccines. There is a lot of crisis diplomacy and vaccine diplomacy is part not only of the WHO and the United Nations, but the G7 and the G20, particularly discussing financing. There have been the creation of alliances. We heard about it. I'll come back to it, particularly COVAX. And new uh, governance mechanisms have been introduced. You will remember when we faced the AIDS crisis, the Global Fund for AIDS, Tuberculosis and Malaria was created. In this context, we have the creation of the ACT Accelerator, for example, and also a technology uh, patent pool. We have uh, new funding mechanisms like the Solidarity Fund, uh, we have uh, the proposal for a vaccine IP waiver. There is a lot of debate. Will that make a difference or not? Those are discussions at the World Trade Organization. There is the use of geopolitical sharing, let me call it that, around mask and vaccine diplomacy, which I'll come back to. And of course, uh, 
we hope that if vaccines are distributed more fairly, uh, that this will contribute to peace and security. No one is safe until everyone is safe. But if you look at uh, countries like uh, Syria, etc., the possibility to vaccine, uh, vaccinate people there is incredibly uh, difficult. We say that there are two types of vaccine diplomacy. There is the vaccine diplomacy that creates solidarity and global cooperation, mostly within multilateral mechanisms. And as already indicated, there is one for geopolitical gain, geopolitical positioning, both long and short term, and uh, geopolitical alliance building around vaccines that we're starting to see. If you look at the diplomacy for solidarity, and since we've heard about it, I don't need to go into it in such detail. Uh, the COVAX initiative is the absolute example for that. And it's also very interesting because this is not just diplomacy between states. It's also diplomacy between organizations and a wide range of public and private actors. We have never seen the international health organizations work together so well towards one goal. And that in itself is a tremendous step forward uh, in global health. You can see here just on this circle, uh, some of these actors that are involved in the Act A and uh, uh, through COVAX. And uh, it's really, really interesting industry, science organizations, uh, World Bank funding organizations have come together to really, really strengthen international collaboration. And we must not underestimate that. There were criticisms of this mechanism, but let's not forget, uh, we got the vaccine much sooner than any one of us would ever have hoped, even you know, the most acclaimed researchers. And so once the vaccine was available and on the market, some of these complex structures weren't yet functioning as well as they should. Not all legal aspects, for example, had been resolved. But we can see with the way it's gathered speed that it's really moving forward well now. Of course, already here we've seen the problem. Many countries, and uh, you can see uh, Germany has been incredibly uh, uh, supportive of COVAX and the multilateral mechanisms, that uh, many of the rich countries, in quotes, have provided funding, funding for COVAX. But then we reached a stage where the money wasn't enough because we needed the vaccines. And uh, so here we have one of the largest geopolitical tensions right now. It's not so much the old development model where the rich give money, it's a new model where the rich need to share concrete vaccines and help in many other ways that were indicated, like, for example, help build production facilities. And uh, the speaker before me sort of alluded to it. The vaccines have become geopolitical tools. You can see here the countries that developed vaccines and who they are sharing it with, what agreements they have made, for example, for clinical trials. Think of the agreement between China and Brazil for the clinical trials with the promise that if these trials are successful, you would have easy access to these vaccines. So it needs a lot of political analyses of vaccine distribution that is only starting right now to go into greater detail. So uh, we can see that right now uh, the global capacity to produce vaccines is only about one third of what we need. And right now we're actually in an additional crisis because of the situation in India. India produces 80 percent of the vaccines needed for COVAX. And uh, at present, point one, they need vaccines themselves. Point two, they need the ingredients to make the vaccines, which not everyone is sharing. 
uh, and uh, point three, you know, they just can't keep up, last not least, because the workers in the vaccine va factories are also uh, affected by the very high infection rates uh, in India. So uh, you can see that a lot of uh, proposals have been uh, put forward to share vaccines, to share patents, and uh, uh, to move forward in quite a different strategy. Uh, much of the discussion has also moved uh, to the World Trade Organization, where the waiver of, for um, uh, vaccines, uh, for patent rights on vaccines is being discussed. The new uh, director of the World Trade Organization, the first woman, the first African, is trying to negotiate between countries how one can uh, find a solution. It's interesting, again, from a geopolitical perspective, as to the fact that it is South Africa and India that have uh, put this proposal uh, to the World Trade Organization. And of course, the groups most opposed to it are the high income countries at present, the US and the European Union, even though there are rumors that they might be willing to uh, find a third way uh, through the diplomacy of the Director General. So, uh, as I said, there are these two types of uh, vaccine diplomacy, one for solidarity, one for geopolitical gain. And we see a systems competition of both hard and soft power of generating trust between countries and playing a long game. And there is quite a fear as the world reshuffles itself that countries will remember who helped them. And this is the approach that countries like China, that countries like Russia and others have used over the last months to say, look, the West is not here to help. And of course, if you look at these two pictures, uh, if China sends vaccines, it has China printed all over it, if COVAX sends vaccines, there is uh, no German flag on this, even though you know, Germany has given a lot of money for COVAX. So once you go into the, geo, into the multilateral sphere, you actually start to lose geopolitical visibility and some of the other countries are exploring this. If we take a quick look at some of the countries, you can see maybe some of you heard President Biden's speech yesterday. He says our vaccines will become arsenal for the world. But before that happens, every American will have access. Every American will be protected from COVID-19. And there is a strong debate within the United States with global health experts and advocates saying that the United States has to move more quickly to share vaccines. Again, the US has given significant funding to COVAX. So again, the old model, we give money, but we don't share our vaccines. In the European Union, again, the EU has given enormous amounts of money to COVAX and the ACT Accelerator. It helped create it. It remains a key exporter. You know, the vaccines used in the United Kingdom for the high uh, vaccination rate, uh, a major part of those were uh, produced within uh, the European Union. So it's also difficult for the European Union to negotiate uh, with uh, its, uh, its member states. And uh, there is, because of the vaccine race, there is tremendous pressure within the Union uh, to uh, first vaccinate within the European Union rather than sharing vaccines. And this is a very, very hot political debate. Russia has explored uh, this, uh, this space, uh, this political space. Uh, it uh, has sent its Sputnik uh, vaccine actually to European Union countries, uh, to Hungary and Slovakia. It's uh, offering more doses to Europe. Uh, some of the German federal states are discussing whether they should buy uh, Sputnik. 
And it's part of a larger geopolitical destabilization agenda to say, look, your own backyard can't guarantee this. We are here to help with cheap prices, with building production facilities and uh, making deals. If you look at the deal made between Bolivia and Russia, we give you vaccines, you give us access to uh, the rare earth materials that you have. China, very similar. China does want to share with COVAX, uh, but uh, it is also providing a wide range of countries with either cheap vaccines or donated vaccines. Here it is particularly in competition with India in Asia, and South Korea will be very familiar with some of these moves. But it's also from the start moving uh, to build production lines, you know, creating infrastructures, building production lines in at least 10 countries. Until recently, the most astute geopolitical player was India. It's a leading vaccine producer. It moved to the TRIPS waiver. It made vaccine diplomacy with its neighboring countries. It made vaccine diplomacy with other geopolitical partners and uh, it moved forward on its commercial approaches. Right now, though, there's a crisis as India sees the surge in cases. The export of vaccines has been uh, reduced, even stopped in some cases. There's a shortage of ingredients, and it's only a couple of days ago that the US lifted the export restrictions on raw materials, nationalism, as we called it. And I've already referred to the reduced uh, production. So we see one major geopolitical challenge that is coming to countries. Everyone relied on India to be the pharmacy of the world. Nobody really thought about the fact that the pharmacy could also be in crises, and then everyone will suffer, both rich and poor countries. This is one of the vaccine alliances that has been created in the Indo-Pacific. Some of you will be uh, familiar with that. So uh, coming uh, to the end, uh, if we look at vaccines and geopolitics, we see that systems competition is played out uh, geopolitically. It offers opportunity for new alliances. Vaccine nationalism actually becomes a destabilizing factor in the relationship between rich and poor countries. And the systems competition between autocracies and democracies is coming to the fore. Since democracies are subject to much more political pressure within their borders to vaccinate people than autocracies, they find it more difficult to share vaccines, which is why uh, they uh, share money. And uh, this is a very, very difficult challenge. Health inequities and vaccine access will continue to drive geopolitics. It's already influencing G7 and G20 negotiations. Uh, it's interesting to see how it's becoming part also of revisiting trade agreements. The South Korean colleagues will know this uh, in relation uh, to the negotiations with the USA on vaccines around the FTA pact. And uh, ODA, we can see, is losing much of its influence. So if we look at it politically, we would say now is the time for the world's democracy to show that they can deliver solidarity. It's a bit tricky. Uh, everyone's waiting for the others to move. The pressure is very high on the United States to act in a similar way as they did with HIV AIDS. Remember the big PEPFAR program. There is a request to have a very pragmatic multilateralism where all vaccine producing countries, West, Russia, China, et cetera, come together to actually move forward together. And there is the suggestion, as you have heard, for a global pandemic treaty. So to end, uh, the, we must counteract the decoupling of global health. Middle powers will play a tremendous role. And here, South Korea is incredibly important 
uh, to raise its voice, to be part of the uh, initiatives that democracies take. Uh, we need the actors to come together. It needs a strong WHO to help move that forward. And I end with the sentence that everyone uses right now, but it is absolutely right and important. No one is safe until all are safe. And if we let your politics get in the way of that, we will all lose. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Kickbush, for this very interesting analysis of the geopolitical dimensions of the debate about access to vaccines. Um, I'm, I'm sure we will come back to this in our discussion later. In the interest of time, I would now switch over to our panel discussion um, and would like to introduce uh, our three distinguished uh, panelists. Um, we have uh, the discussion on challenges and best practice in search of effective vaccination strategies. We have now seen two presentations focusing um, on the global aspects of vaccination. And I'm now um, looking forward to our discussion about the more national perspective on vaccination strategies. First of all, I would like to welcome Professor He Chang Jiang, the director of the National Institute of Infectious Diseases of Korea. Before he received his PhD in medical science in 2011 from John Nam National University, Professor Chang engaged as a volunteer doctor in a program of the Korean International Cooperation Agency. Welcome, Professor Yang. Thank you very much for being us, with us today. Our second speaker is Ms. Stella Danek, who serves as policy officer on COVID response at the German Federal Ministry of Health. Her work focuses on cross-departmental cooperation, the national testing and vaccination strategy. And in addition, she heads special operations at two vaccination centers in Berlin. Good morning, Ms. Dunning. Welcome and thank you that you're here with us. And our third speaker is Dr. Andrea Haselbeck, who is working as a senior research scientist at the International Vaccine Institute in Seoul. Here she leads the intervention and implementation research department and in her work she focuses on multinational infectious disease surveillance and vaccination programs in sub-Saharan Africa and Southeast Asia. Welcome Dr. Haselbeck, thank you very much for being with us today. My first question goes to Professor Zhang. You are heading Korea's uh, Central Institute of uh, Infectious Diseases, the central institution with regard to disease surveillance and prevention. What are the primary objectives of the Korean national vaccination campaign and what are central challenges? And what is the role of the National Institute of Vaccine uh, of infectious diseases in Korea with regard to the implementation of the vaccination strategy. Yeah, thank, thank you. Thank you for inviting me to this event tonight, eh, today. Yeah. Today is also a very important day for me because I was given AstraZeneca vaccine today according to the Korean government's vaccination schedule. <laughs> but unfortunately, I have some side, uh, some adverse reactions, including flu-like symptoms. So please, uh, please understand my poor condition. <laughs> and number one, the primary goal uh, of the Korean national vaccination campaign is that to reduce the number of deaths from COVID-19 at the herd immunization. To this end, the elderly and high-risk groups are being vaccinated first before June to, uh, 2021. And next, after that, in order to, in order to achieve uh, herd immunity if possible and reduce the prevalence uh, of COVID-19 in Korea, we are trying to vaccinate the whole country within this year if possible. But the most difficult part and the central challenge is that the vaccination supply schedule is non regular, very regular, and sometimes inadequate as experienced in many other countries. So uh, if we have uh, enough vaccines uh, timely, we can respond some issues in uh, including some side effect issue, 
uh, and some other issues, and we can increase the vaccination rate faster. And number two question is that the role of National Institute of Infectious Diseases in Korea. Actually, the National Institute of Infectious Diseases in Korea is actually R&D organization to support the new vaccines in Korea. So we are trying to develop uh, our own COVID-19 vaccines now. But the other role is that uh, we are organizing the preclinical test research and clinical test research of vaccines currently available in, in the world. And in addition to uh, such a work, uh, we are providing a scientific basis for policy making by conducting clinical studies on uh, adverse reaction and immunogenicity and cross, cross -immunization, immunization issues in Korea. And number three question, uh, what lessons did Korea learn uh, during the course of the vaccination? First, we learned that vaccination, vaccine production worldwide is uh, uh, inadequate compared to the demand. So accordingly, Korea feels that it should make more contributions to the world's vaccination production by Korea. And especially we are feeling that the responsibility of providing vaccines to under uh, some countries in Asia. Uh, second, uh, we learned that we must try not only to produce, but also to rapidly develop our own Korean vaccines. Third, uh, in Korea, people are very interested of the adverse reactions compared to other countries. And if there is some uh, adverse reaction or uh, death cases, uh, it is reported as uh, breaking news regardless of the causality in Korea. So I feel it is very important to reassure these national worries. And finally, Korea is a country that has succeeded in quarantine, but the vaccination speed is not fast. So if we gain some experience in this pandemic vaccination, uh, we are expected that a rapid vaccination system will be established in Korea. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Zhang. Let's switch over to Ms. Danik. Ms. Danik, Germany started its vaccination program against COVID-19 end of December 2020, and you have been involved in the development of the German vaccination strategy from the beginning. What are important cornerstones of, the, of Germany's vaccination strategy and what are central challenges? Uh, how is the strategy, uh, strategy implemented? Who are key actors and institutions? Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank you again for the organization of this really interesting forum. And I would like to expand again on the point that Professor Kickbush made. A few months ago, we, or a year ago, we did not imagine that in December 2020, we would have a viable vaccine available. So I think this is something that we should all keep in mind when talking about vaccination strategies as well, because usually it takes eight to 12 years to develop a vaccine. And within nearly a year after the start of the pandemic, we had viable vaccines available. So as you said, our vaccination campaign started nearly exactly four months ago on December 27th. In Germany so far, we have um, distributed or administered 26 million vaccines to date, and that makes 20 million first doses and 6 million full immunization schedules, and that's uh, nearly one quarter of our population. So nearly every fourth inhabitant has now been offered a vaccine. I would like to touch upon a few major points that are a part of every element of our vaccination strategy instead of going through every step of our vaccination strategy from development to international cooperation. And I think there are two elements that can be found in everything from fostering R&D production to implementation as well as our international cooperation. And that is one, the scientific foundation of everything that we do, and two, our cross-sectoral and cross-sectoral dialogue. So for example, with our scientific foundation, that's very important when we look at market authorization, the prioritization of our vaccines, the development of our vaccines, but also monitoring effectiveness and safety of our vaccines. And this is something we can see in our entire 
in vaccination strategy. The other thing that has been a very, very important um, aspect and cornerstone is our dialogue with all of the sectors and all of the actors involved. So that means within Germany nationally, the federal and the state level. For those of you who are familiar with the organization of the German state, we have 16 federal states. There is the federal government in Berlin, but then there is also very strong federal states that implement their own um, organization of the vaccination strategy. And so, of course, there is always a very important dialogue going back and forth to align on goals and implementation. Then there is the dialogue that we have with private and um, public actors. So we we, of course, as the Ministry of Health, have a very active dialogue with the other ministries in the government, but then also with other actors, for example, industry, as you know, BioNTech, um, for example, is a German company, so it's very important to hear be in dialogue also with the industry, but then also professional groups like our medical associations, our hospital associations, and the pharmaceutical industry at large. And then, of course, also there is the international dialogue that's very important to fostering our um, vaccination strategy. As you know, we are a member of the European Union and uh, a very vocal one. So it's really important to hear be in the European dialogue, but then also our international commitment to vaccines as a global public good and our contribution here, for example, to ACTA with now more than 2 billion US dollars. So those uh, two things, our scientific foundation and everything that we do, but also the dialogue that we hold with all of the actors involved are two very important cornerstones. I would like to um, talk about the one challenge I think that has also been the, the topic of the four speakers, which is the limited availability, obviously, of the vaccines to date. And also something that we have experienced in the past months is an adaptation to changing delivery schedules, for example, due to production errors or exports of vaccines to other countries. We have to adapt to changes in the availability of vaccines. So how have we coped with that so far? And we have also applied a prioritization schedule. So in the beginning, and this is now opening more and more, an offer was specifically made to people who are exposed or vulnerable, so the elderly population, population with pre-existing conditions, but also exposed populations. So in particular, our healthcare workers. And the other thing that we have done is we have actively fostered production of vaccines. So we have a task force for vaccine production here in the federal government. And for example, this month, the new BioNTech production plant has opened here in Germany, as some of the um, speakers before have mentioned, production is a very challenging process. For example, in the plant here in Marburg, it's 50,000 single steps to just produce uh, the vaccine here. And those are just the latest or last steps within the vaccine production schedule. So we're very happy to um, have been able to contribute to another production plant that will also ensure not only our local, but also global supply of vaccines. Thank you very much for sharing these insights. Um, I would now like to uh, switch over to Dr. Haselbeck. Uh, Dr. Haselbeck, your work focuses on vaccination programs in African and Southeast Asian countries. And we have heard during the debate before that uh, in particular, poor and middle income countries are affected and not uh, have not equal access to vaccines uh, against COVID-19 at the moment. What are your ob observations? What effects uh, do national vaccination strategies have on poorer countries? And how do debates of vaccine safety in rich countries influence the perception uh, in poorer countries? Yeah, thank you. I would like to uh, just echo what all of the previous um, speakers have already mentioned. Thank you for the invitation. I'm happy to contribute to this discussion here today. Um, so when talking or discussion, uh, discussing the perceptions or the considerations in LMICs, there are different um, factors that we have to acknowledge, right? Um, 
there is already um, vaccine uh, campaigns that are running, um, very important routine immunizations that um, need to be acknowledged and um, we have to make sure that these are not disrupted. So um, even without a pandemic going on, we know that logistics can be challenged at some times um, and that countries might not have the, the same stable situation as we know from, from the globe on the northern globe. Um, so this is a very important point that we um, strengthen the capacities in a way that we have all these routine immunizations going and we do not risk having measles outbreaks as we had in the past when the um, vaccine coverage wasn't high enough because of disruptions in the, in the conduct of these campaigns. Um, and I think this is um, a very important point that uh, we, we know from sub-Saharan African settings um, that we are working with um, and, and supporting. And the other factor is that we have learned that a very well-informed um, communication strategy is key um, to avoid any disruptions that are maybe based on a community or individual uh, level because of stigmatization, because of um, worries around the vaccine safety um, that you can only avoid when you include local stakeholders and uh, key personnel from these settings into the communication and the preparation of any of these um, vaccination campaigns. Um, so this is what we know on, on national um, vaccination strategies in the past um, when trying to support regulatory authorities to, um, uh, to gather the sufficient evidence uh, and vaccine safety and efficacy data to either register um, a, a new vaccine or to, um, to support the, the conduct of a clinical trial to understand the effectiveness in that setting. Um, we've learned that um, the capacities that need to be strengthened are immense and this is what, what we've been trying to contribute for the past year um, so that we not only have um, you know, the common um, evidence um, from clinical trials in, in the settings that, we, that they are already running but also um, considering mutations and new variants going around the world, we need um, data also from other settings and I think the African continent is, is one of the, the, the ones that has been um, a bit neglected maybe in the past <laughs> in these um, uh, circumstances. I think they can benefit um, from actually learning lessons and trying to um, reach a sustainable capacity building that not only supports regulatories in country but also logistical channel channels, um, the capacity for conducting clinical trials, and the capacity to enable technology transfer, which um, Jerome has mentioned earlier, that um, this will enable manufacturers, although this is a very complex and, and time-needing um, activity, uh, we can use actually the attention that this pandemic um, is bringing to the implementation of vaccines um, in these settings and implement um, yeah, and, and, and form new hubs so that we can have um, a much better availability um, also for other vaccines after COVID-19 because we have to start thinking also um, long term rather than just for this or next year maybe. Um, yeah, I hope I've <laughs> responded to your questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Haselbeck. I think uh, one word that you mentioned uh, um, appropriate in this context that uh, we are debating here in the, in the um, uh, high income countries how to um, procure uh, our population with safe vaccines but we may not forget to, to address uh, also long standing um, challenges in the low and middle income countries. Thank you very much. I would now uh, like to uh, come back to Dr. Kim, um, uh, who gave his very uh, insightful presentation on the 
um, current state of uh, vaccine development and all the challenges that are related to the global distribution. Dr. Kim, we have heard a lot now about um, how to implement um, effective vaccination campaigns and strategies, but what in your view are the preconditions for a successful um, vaccination campaign? What are the three biggest challenges or uh, preconditions that need to be uh, available or that need to be achieved in order to uh, achieve the vaccine goals? So I think the, the first one, and, and many of us have talked about it, is supply. We need to have a significantly greater supply of vaccine available uh, for use around the world. And, and that's, you know, vaccine, vaccine, vaccine. We need the vaccines. But vaccination is actually the big, uh, is the key component here. And so we not only need the supply, but we need to be able to get it out. We are turning what, what would normally be an extended program of immunization, an EPI program in kids, to a universal program of vaccination. So those infants, their brothers and sisters, their moms and dads, and their grandparents all need to be vaccinated. And that's an undertaking that we've never done before. And maybe this might be something that survives COVID. So now we can look at lifetime vaccination for everybody, which would be a great thing. The second part is data. And, and there is just a huge shortage of data. If you look at the map, there isn't a lot of COVID in Africa. Many of us think that that is not the case. We need to get information on burden from countries around the world. The, um, the amount of COVID in India right now is substantial. It may actually be even greater than we think because we have to have appropriate levels of testing. We have to be able to sequence variants because variants are going to be a really important part of whether the vaccines are working. But on top of that, we need information on effectiveness. Are these vaccines actually doing what they're supposed to do? And I, and I say that, you know, we, we, you, we have the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine, and they're a greater than 90% efficacy. But that efficacy was determined looking at the protection of an individual. And what we're looking at in the next phase is the protection of society. Does the vaccine decrease hospitalization, severe infection, hospitalization, and death? Because that's what we need in order to have a public health effect. Finally, we don't have any information on transmission. And in the absence of that information, we're going to need to continue to wear masks after being vaccinated for some period of time. And it's really important that sometime we start generating information on the impact of vaccination on transmission of COVID-19. Finally, we have to remember systematic prevention. Vaccines are only a part of the solution. We still need to continue to distance, use masks, and avoid crowds until such time as sufficient levels of vaccination are present in the population uh, so that gradually the things that we put into place to control COVID can be withdrawn. Thank you very much, Dr. Kim. My next question goes to Professor Kickbush who was highlighting in her presentation the uh, health uh, diplomacy or the vaccine diplomacy and uh, the international debate, how to cope with this challenge to uh, ensure global equity to um, global equity to vaccine access. Mm. I would like to pick up one uh, remark that you made. Um, it was the remark about the rumors that uh, were uh, existing about a third way regarding uh, to find a solution how to better um, share the, um, yeah, the access to COVID-19 vaccines and production. Could you elaborate a bit more on that, Professor Kickbush? Well, sadly, I can't because I'm not part of the negotiations. I think, uh, you know, there is a very... Uh, <clears throat> extensive debate about uh, where a patent waiver really makes a difference if you don't have production facilities, as we just heard, and also if you don't have the logistics to actually vaccinate people. And uh, so it seems there will probably uh, possibly be uh, some uh, diplomatic agreements around uh, certain time frames. Uh, about uh, being uh, having uh, a sharing of patents in production facilities, etc. 
I think uh, at present it doesn't look as if a total waiver uh, would uh, happen, as was asked in the initial uh, proposal from South Africa and India. But it's also an important issue that will be taken into the discussions uh, on a global pandemic treaty. Because as you know, uh, in the international health regulations, uh, there is the declaration of a public health emergency of international concern by the World Health Organization, which was issued last year towards the end of January. Now, that's a risk assessment. That is not saying we are in a pandemic. Actually, the word pandemic doesn't appear in uh, the international health regulations. WHO doesn't declare pandemics. It declares the risk uh, a, a public health emergency of international concern. And so now people are discussing if we were to think about a treaty, would a treaty trigger certain uh, events? Would it trigger a certain type of funding? Would it tribu uh, uh, trigger a certain kind of sharing? Uh, would it uh, uh, trigger certain kinds of information uh, strategies? Uh, the possibility for investigation. Now, at present, a big resolution is being negotiated at the World Health Assem uh, Assembly in preparation for the Assembly. And it's quite clear a group of countries is not very interested in strengthening uh, the investigation dimension. Uh, there are others who are more worried about uh, the waiver of uh, patents and in this case also transparency. Uh, WHO has a resolution from the World Health Assembly two years ago on transparency of pricing, which is also an issue that has come up in the context of vaccines. So uh, I think all these things sort of interface and as always in diplomacy, even if you negotiate in one forum like uh, the World Trade Organization, you use it uh, to make uh, diplomatic arrangements and deals that then also apply to other organizations. So in one way, it's quite timely that the World Trade Organization negotiations and the World Health Organization negotiations are more or less going on at the same time because negotiators can come together. And the last uh, point on this is that it's, of course, interesting if you look at diplomatic representations uh, in Geneva, where there is both the World Trade Organization and the World Health Organization, uh, they have diplomats for trade and diplomats for health. And now these diplomats really have to work together in conjunction uh, to actually resolve this issue. And that leads us back to, you know, you need collaboration at the global level, but it, you also need that domestic cooperation. Does your foreign office talk to the trade office, talk to the health ministry, et cetera, et cetera. And often we neglect that part and forget that a different group of people is negotiating something that's going to be absolutely critical for larger vaccine equity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Kickbush, for this really interesting, relevant information. Um, in the interest of time, I would now um, invite my three panelists, Professor Zhang, Ms. Danek, and Dr. Haselbeck for a last uh, round of short uh, questions. Um, really brief, um, my first question would go to Professor Zhang uh, as a kind of closing remark for our dis discussion. What can Germany learn from South Korea with regard to the implementation of a vaccine campaign? Please, just a brief answer. So, excuse me, what's the main point of the question? Can I, uh, my can question I give one more time? Would be, no problem. My question would be, as a kind of closing remark from your side, what can Germany learn from the South Korean vaccination campaign? I see. I think uh, actually Korea should learn from uh, Germany more. <laughs> but uh, 
in Korea, actually, we have some experience from you know, MERS, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. Uh, and uh, at that time, I was also a specialist in infectious disease, in, and I take care of the MERS patients also. And during that time, we learned a lot from, a lot from uh, how to... Uh, how to manage the disease and a lot, uh, some quarantine strategy. But this time, uh, for this reason, I think the co uh, Korean government can uh, manage the COVID-19 well uh, because of the MERS experience. So I, I expect that in this time uh, for vaccination campaign, we are not much experienced. So I think in this time we can learn about the COVID-19 vaccina vaccination uh, to respond to pandemic. So actually, uh, I recommend that uh, the experience, previous experience is very, very important for all of us. So maybe for uh, during the COVID-19 outbreak, we will learn about uh, how to manage the pandemic. So uh, I'm, I'm not saying that uh, for the quarantine issue, uh, Germany government should learn from Korea and there's some points, but in vaccination issue, I think we together should learn how to uh, develop effective vaccination strategies by government and the uh, companies. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Chang. And now my question goes to Ms. Danek. What can South Korea learn from the German vaccination strategy? What would be your recommendations? Thank you. I was afraid that you were gonna ask that. I think Professor Zhang, I, we would be very happy to have further discussions and exchange with you to uh, talk a little bit more about our lessons learned and your lessons learned. But I think we ourselves in Germany can also learn a lot from our experience so far. We are still running, the vaccination campaign is obviously still ongoing. And I think one thing that we can definitely improve upon is our flexibility, our trust in the local solutions when we have um, ensured that there is a federal um, uh, legislation that provides for local solutions to be implemented and something that we have very much also followed with interest in particular in the beginning of the campaign or in the beginning also of the COVID pandemic is how flexible and fast Korea has responded, for example, with its testing and tracing um, a policies and this is something that we would definitely be interested in learning more about but for those of you who are familiar with EU law of course we have uh, strict data protection laws and that's something that I think we can learn a lot from uh, about from Korea but also the Asian countries in general about how we can implement um, digital technologies in a fast way to also help the pandemic response. Thank you very much, Ms. Danek. And finally, my question goes to Dr. Haselbeck. What is your view of what can the richer countries uh, learn from vaccination strategies or um, more general from handling the COVID-19 pandemic in low and middle income countries? What would be your take on that? Good question. I think um, what we can learn is that they are always aware because they um, are tackled with infectious diseases um, on a complete different uh, level than, than we are. We are in that sense a bit spoiled, I can say. <laughs> um, and um, so we can learn from them to be aware, to be very quick, to be very flexible. Um, there is a different trust in vaccines in general, I would say, comparing it to other settings that we've learned. There are individual perceptions that um, might not align with the public health safety um, idea. And um, this is something that um, always surprises me a lot, um, how dedicated healthcare workers are and how much they contribute um, in order to, uh, to, to supplement or to, to support 
um, the health uh, health responses in the different settings. And um, I think for us as IVI, uh, what we've done and what we are very happy um, to be able to work with um, very trusted collaborators um, is supporting them in um, redirecting any project uh, healthcare facility staffing to um, the COVID response, um, which might still um, happen these days. And we, we were cautiously monitoring the development in the different countries that we are um, working with. Um, yeah, and we're hoping to uh, get effectiveness data very soon, as Jerome mentioned. We think this is very crucial moving forward. Um, yeah, and I think uh, they are working very hard uh, to, to do that. So very happy to support that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Haselbeck. Since time is running out, I would li now like to close our discussion. And um, before I hand over to my colleague, Thomas Yoshimura, the director of CAS country office in Korea for his closing remarks and for his wrap up, I would like to thank all experts for sharing their knowledge and insights on vaccination strategies and their geopolitical implications. I think a lot of many important issues have been addressed uh, in our discussion. Um, I would like to thank our partners, the Embassy of the Republic uh, of Korea and the International Vaccine Institute for the excellent cooperation. And last but not least, I would like to thank you, dear audience, for your interest and for your participation in our event. And now uh, yeah, I hand over to Thomas Yoshimura for the wrap up and the closing remarks of our discussion. Thank you very much and goodbye from my side. Yes, Machina, thank you very much. Now I have the last task to say the last words uh, and bring back, I will try at least, some of the highlights uh, that we had through, through our discussions before. I have the honor also to, to close the event. Please stay on a few more minutes. I will make it short, but I'd like to remind you of some of the things that I wrote down, which impressed me uh, from the keynotes onwards uh, through our discussion. Uh, Ambassador Cho, in the beginning, she started with the sentence that was repeated afterwards that no one is safe until everyone is safe. I can underline that. It was brought up. Uh, uh, we talked about the light at the end of the tunnel, which Dr. Kim also brought up in his keynote speech then afterwards with the slide, I remember. And saying that uh, we have to make clear that although there is a light and the vaccines that we're talking about are a, a light at the end of the tunnel. The fight is not over yet. And she started with very impressively uh, lining out the difference between the over 20% that we have in the developed countries that are somehow vaccinated on the one hand. And I tried to calculate, she said, 0.2% uh, in the developing countries. That's a difference of a hundredfold, I understand. So we see where the challenge is. Um, and sh then, the uh, message by Mr. Bikestov uh, showed that the IVI is working on that field and has also pointed out that there is an ongoing cooperation already with Germany. For example, he pointed out uh, with the Robert Koch Institute, Tübingen, Fresenius Institute, the BMBF, which is certainly worth expanding. And Dr. Jim, uh, Dr. Kim brought through the phases of prove it, make it, use it, value it, which I find very easy to remember and structure the whole issue. We know that the vaccine works, but we have to work on quantity, quality, and distribution, uh, as I recall. And uh, it was encouraging to say that there are more vaccines on the way and to reassure that we have already uh, achieved quite something and that some bucks always need to be worked out in a phase in the beginning. Uh, but that we have a great challenge, 16 billion uh, vaccines we will need uh, to have all the population on, on this planet vaccinated. And uh, this is a huge task. We might have 11 billion by the end of next year somehow, which I find encouraging. Uh, but nevertheless, additional measures will remain uh, vital for that. Um, it is also encouraging to see that uh, producers of the vaccines who have that challenge, they're licensing competitors. Uh, we have achieved a lot uh, just by spreading that out. The process is the product is something that is obviously uh, set in vaccine production, but I think it's true for the efforts that we're in. The process we're making is already a product that we have achieved, and they're uh, very encouraging signs. Germany and uh, the Republic of Korea, who are functional or stringent in the process, can play a role and should play a role. 
Um, then uh, you pointed out, Dr. Kim, uh, something about the uh, initiative for, for using the vaccination, how important it is and how big, again, the challenge is uh, that still 60%, you get brought that example, of the world's children do not get the vaccination for Rota, which has been ex uh, established uh, and, and um, accepted many years ago or some years ago already and still we were 60%. So what COVAX uh, will or is like to, to achieve the 20% in 198 countries is remarkable by itself. Nevertheless, we have to work on the uh, remaining 80%. Inequity cannot remain. We cannot allow for double global death rate to, uh, for a global death rate to double if we do not uh, cope with it and the enormous four to five trillion dollars of damage that might occur if we do not. Uh, we still have a lot to talk about. Um, COVAX is only 20% uh, and there's three vaccines now, maybe a little more today. Also encouraging sign that there's uh, something and we learn more about mutants nevertheless. And then you hand it over to Professor Kickbush talking about ge geopolitical aspects. And geopolitical aspects uh, is, of course, somehow working against, uh, as she said, in seven dimensions of vaccine diplomacy, but the two types that somehow stand against each other, global solidarity and COVAX being a sign of that on the one hand, and ge geopolitical gain and alliance building on the other. Uh, and then she also pointed out that the, uh, even the encouraging COVAX signs, 80% of that, she reiterated, is uh, produced in India, remember that, and India is challenging the fa the, uh, facing the challenges that we uh, know and hear about. And geopolitical aspects, I find it interesting and re uh, would like to repeat that uh, the impression might be that the West is not here to help or that people talk about that, and we should take that uh, maybe as a saying that there can be done more. Um, the speech by President Biden was uh, quoted where it somehow seemed uh, um, first the Americans, something reminds me of, of another term I heard uh, over the last years. Uh, in the EU we have a hot debate whereas the People's Republic of China and Russia remain open to play the geopolitical game and remain visible in doing so. Uh, in India it shows again that there is geopolitical try but also uh, somebody who is trying to play the game can be back in crisis and now with the 80% of COVAX being produced in India, um, that system is still also in a, in a crisis and we might think about how to, how to tackle that. The question remains, she said, can dem democracies deliver the solidarity it needs now? Uh, play it geopolitically or not, but at least deliver something that helps. And middle powers, Republic of Korea, Federal Republic of Germany, and multilateralism must contra uh, contract on decoupling and playing too geopolitically in the same uh, in the whole thing because no one is safe until all are safe. In the discussion, let me quickly uh, uh, wrap up that or remind us of what was said um, by Dr. John Donick and Dr. Hasselbeck. Um, the lessons learned in Korea, I would like to give. Uh, we need more encouragement in the region. Uh, uh, Dr. Jang said. The inequity allocation was something that, uh, that the Republic of Korea learned about. Also, how quickly communication and the spread of bad news was in the vaccination campaign and how things, of course, got onto the news if something doesn't work. Um, and that on the one hand, Korea was successful in quarantine measures, uh, but on the other hand, he also uh, admitted that maybe vaccination was not as rapid as he would have liked it or would like it to be, of course, also here. Um, Ms. Donick reminded us again, we have vaccines since December 2020, within one year of the outbreak of the, of the pandemic, or as it was declared a pandemic. Um, and the two cornerstones of a success story, or of the success that Germany had was the role of science and the trust in science and the dialogue with science and the cross-sectoral dialogue domestically and internationally. Uh, let me underline that, how, how obviously that was something we had and, and were able to learn. Uh, still for vaccination to be successful, availability and the adaption to the changing deliver delivery schedules was something to learn uh, for, our, for Germany also. Germany and Korea have also started production facilities uh, and I found it interesting to say that there are 50,000, if I rightly uh, understood, steps that are now taken in the German facility. For the least and middle income countries, um, 
on the one hand, it's now a challenge, but what we learn uh, that the pandemic is a challenge, but uh, there's ongoing campaigns that may not be interrupted. That challenge is huge as well. Let not, let's not forget about that. Um, we need to inform, we need to build trust there, include local stakeholders, is, uh, was reiterated by Dr. Haselbeck here in, in Seoul. And we need data and experience showing to build up capacities now in the LMIC, not only for the ongoing pandemic, but also beyond COVID-19. Uh, in the final round, I, am, uh, I would have been happy to have, of course, more questions to, to answer also from everyone, but we were at least uh, able to sum up again the preconditions we need now for a success forward. We need supply, we need, a, this is a universal campaign, it's much bigger than anything we had in vaccine campaigning. Um, we need to make sure that we have more data on what has already been achieved, where we are. Uh, transmission uh, uh, information is crucial to, to know when additional measures uh, will maybe at some point be no longer uh, required. Nevertheless, now they are. A prevention, systemic, uh, systematic prevention was the third point that was mentioned. We need not drop caution or additional measures too early, otherwise uh, the challenge, challenge will remain or get bigger again. Um, international cooperation, something very informative, I thought, was the new tandems that are now arising in Geneva, I understand. Uh, WTO and WHO, but also within the embassies, people have to think together to solve this in both trade uh, issues and health issues. And this is reflected hopefully more on the domestic uh, level also, which might help in the next uh, challenge also. Um, lessons learned between Germany and the Republic of Korea. Let me just say, no one was willing to say, you have to learn from us, but please, we would like to learn from you. I think that is a, uh, a nice way to put it. Uh, we have to learn now for the future, something I took out from the words from Dr. Zhang. And uh, Ms. Donick again said that uh, we have to, in, in Europe, think about more flexibility, think about more trust in local solutions, and you know, maybe leap drop down some of our uh, ideas about perfectionism when it comes to, to handling data, uh, protecting data, but rather think about how useful they could be once we have them and, and make use of them. And the high awareness and taking this serious is something that the least middle income countries can teach us, uh, said Dr. Hasselbeck, if I understand her correctly. This is something that might help us to as we say, at least the Germans jump over our shadow uh, to get out of the idea that we have to that out, protect our data first, maybe protect our lives before we do that. So uh, no one is safe until everyone is safe. Uh, I think we're still in the middle of something and it's good to have the exchange of it, uh, learn about it, but not forget about others, uh, but have the international community in mind. I have the honor of closing it. I thank you, thank the audience who was listening until the end. Thank uh, the presenters, the panelists again, and our partners, but that has been done. And I wish you a wonderful evening. I wish you a wonderful day, and I wish you the best of health. Thank you.